<laughs> okay, uh, today we're going to teach you kind of one of the, the last new things. Uh, you'll, have, you'll have a little bit tomorrow as well, but today is your last different operation. So on, on a Tuesday, I taught you a new operation in mathematics. Does anybody know what that operation was? Start with C, good. Rhymes with opposition. Composition, right. We, we did this thing on Tuesday. We did F composed of G. Remember that? That, that wasn't too tough, was it? But it was new. And anytime we call on things that are new, sometimes sometimes we you know kind of get a little fearful of it, but it really wasn't that big of a deal. Um, in order to talk about today's uh, operation, which is inverses, and it looks like that. Function inverses, that's what it looks like. In order to talk about function inverses, the functions first need to be one to one. In order for a function to be one to one, a function is said to be one to one if it passes both the vertical and horizontal line tests. So, let's look at an example of this. Does that pass the vertical line test? Nope. Does it pass the horizontal line test? Neither one, right? So this is not a function, and it's not one-to-one. -one. Does that one pass the vertical line test? So it's a function. Does it pass the horizontal line test? No, so it's not a one-to-one -one function. Does that pass the vertical line test? Does it pass the horizontal line test? So it is both, uh, so it's a function and it's one-to-one. -one. So uh, in order for a function to be one-to-one, -one, it must pass the horizontal and vertical line test, just kind of like I wrote there, okay? So, we ready to move on? All right, so what do we know about function inverses? First of all, F inverse does not mean one over F. It doesn't mean you drop it to the denominator. We kind of run out of ways to explain things mathematically. Uh, our language is uh, very limited. And so here's what uh, function inverse means. It means that x becomes y. And it means that y becomes x. The domain becomes the range, and the range becomes the domain. Hopefully you're understanding why we've kind of talked about domain and range and functions and things like that in this unit because they all kind of tie together in this piece. So I'm going to give you an example. I'll give you the easiest example that I can. All right. Uh, Maya, what is your number in basketball? And what is your game high for points for your entire career? Four. Okay, we'll say four. So we've got one point. That is a function. It says player number 24 scored four points. So I want to know what F of 24 is. That means if I have an X value of four, what is the Y value? If the X value is 24, what's the Y value? Four. Well, good. If I said F of 4, do we have an X value of 4? No. So there is, there's, there's no answer there. You can't produce F of 4. If I switch it and I do inverse, if I do F inverse of 4, what that means is instead of an X value, what it means is that's the Y value. So if I have a y value 4, what's the x value that corresponds to it? 24. 
And if I ask you F inverse of 24, that means if you have a Y value of 24, do we have a corresponding X value for a Y value of 24? No, so there is no result there. I'm just saying, so if I would have given you this, so suppose I would have given you, uh, I'm sorry, suppose I would have given you uh, 4, uh, 9, then in that situation, uh, f of 4 would have been 9, because you do have an x value of 4. And if I would have given you, um, say, uh, a 3, 24, then f inverse of 24 would have been 3. But you don't have any, any points that, that do that. Okay. Now, example one, it says f of 2 is 3, so that means that the x value is 2 and the y value is 3. f of 1 is 9, f of negative 3 is 8, f of 4 is 5. And it's one to one function. Find the following. f inverse of 8, that means if you have a y value of 8, what is the corresponding x value? Yeah. Negative 3. F inverse of 3, if you have a y value 3, what is the corresponding x value? 2. F inverse of 5, if you have a y value 5, then the x value is 4. And F inverse of 9 will be 1. So, could you do that on a test? Yeah, it's new, but it's not necessarily that difficult, is it? We can actually make function inverses pretty difficult. We're going to look at the easy side of things. It's new, but we're going to look at the easy parts. Okay, it says given f of x is 3x minus 8, find f inverse of 6. Suppose it says saying f inverse of 6. Suppose I said find f of 6. What would you do with that 6? You plug it in for x, right? But this doesn't say f of 6. This says f inverse of 6. What that means is that this is the y value. So I don't plug in for x, I plug it in there. So I get 6 is equal to 3x minus 8. So instead of going for x, it goes in for the function value. Could we then find x? Yeah, we're going to add 8, and we get 14 is equal to 3x. We divide by 3, and we get 14 thirds is equal to x. Any questions there? All right, for the next part, it says find the inverses of the following functions. So this is the same thing as y is equal to 2x minus 5. So there's another function that actually has an inverse. So instead of finding a specific value, so here you're finding specific values, you're actually going to come up with a new function. And all we have to do is look at this. What happens to the x and the y's? Yeah, they, they switch spots, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to rewrite this, but we're going to switch the x and the y's. So instead of a y, I have an x. Instead of an x, I have a y. And now all you need to do is you just solve for y. What would I do if I wanted to solve for y? Add 5. Okay, x plus 5 is equal to 2y. Divide by 2. You could write it like that, or you could write x over 2 plus 5 over 2. It doesn't matter. Either one is the same. You okay with that? Okay, so you help me do the next one. What will I write here? Great, so that's the function. So I want to find the inverse, so what do you do? So x is equal to 6 minus 4y. So x minus 6 is equal to negative 4y. And I'm going to write this negative 1 fourth x, or you could write as negative x over 4. So a few different ways you could write it. Uh, these negatives are going to cancel. 6 divided by 4 is 3 halves. 
that's equal to y. Not too bad, huh? You sure can. That's fine as well. Okay, not too much more left. These four examples. Y equals x cubed plus 1. We're going to switch the x and the y to get x is equal to y cubed plus 1. What would you do? So I get x minus 1 is equal to y cubed. Cubed root. Now I have y is equal to x over 5. So I'll switch that. x is equal to y over 5. If you don't see what to do here, you can always look at it as like cross multiplying. So y times 1 is y, and 5 times x is 5x. I'd like to show you something kind of cool with that. If I were to look at those couple of functions, if I were to look at x divided by 5, and I were to look at 5x and graph them, look at what I get here. So that's my x over 5, that's my 5x. If I were to graph another line, just y equals x, that's our kind of our identity function. If we plug that in, it should always split it perfectly in half. Yeah. If you were to take one and flip it over that line, you'd get the other. Perfectly splits it in half. I'll do one more here. X cubed, X raised to the third, plus one. And then we'll do the cubed root. So math, I'll do cubed root number four, cubed root of X minus one. And watch how it will perfectly split it in half. Kind of neat, huh? Happens all the time. Last example. Uh, flip to this part so we can answer the question. How do we test to see if something are inverses? Well, we do our thing that we did the other day, which is composition. F and G are inverses if, when you compose them together, they produce just X. And you have to, comp you have to pr or compose them both ways. You have to do f of g, and you also have to do g of f. So that's the last thing we're going to do today, is we're going to compose these two functions together, and they should hopefully produce x. All right. So it says use the property of inverses to determine if f and g are inverses. We have f is this and g is that. So I'm going to do f of g of x. I'm going to do g of f of x. How do I do that? Do I start with f or do I start with g? Yep, I start with g. And where do I put it? Yep, I put it right over here. So you have 3 times whatever is going in for x, which is this thing, x plus 5 divided by 3, and then you have minus 5. Let's see what happens. If we compose these two functions together, what's going to happen to these threes? Yeah, you have 3 over 1 times this thing over 3, and those threes will cancel. So you'll get x plus 5 minus 5. 
what's x plus 5 minus 5? It's just x. And that's what we want. You always want to come out with just x. But you do need to compose it both ways. So g of f of x, which one do I start with now? Start with f, and I plug it in right here. I, I thought I heard a sound. Okay. So I get 3x minus 5. So I'm plugging in for the x. What do I have after that? Plus the 5, all divided by 3. What's going to be the first thing to cancel here? Yeah, the 5 and the negative 5, so we get 3x over 3. And 3x over 3 is? So I got x for both of them, so yes, they are inverses. Um, this one, I start with G, G is the cubed root, and drop it in there, and I get cubed root of X, and then what am I doing to that? Cubing it. What happens when you cube the cube root of x? Cancels out, you get x. And then this one looks similar, but it, it is it is a little bit different. Here I started with cube root of x. What do we start with here? Start with the x cubed, yeah. And then what do we put on the outside of it? Cube root. What happens when you cube root a cube. Yep. Those go away and get x. So those are inverses of each other as well. Not too bad? Look at what you've learned. New stuff. Like a champion. 17 and a half minutes.